First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this outstanding place. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to be here. It's not my first time, but the always the sunshine, so I don't know how you make it. But in contrast to Copenhagen, where I come from, you can be sure it will be, ra it will be raining. Um, so that also makes me to do research on, on extreme events, um, extreme things. I'm particularly interested in heavy tailed time series and uh, I'm interested in heavy tail phenomena so if you have some kind of a system and then you have maybe some heavy tailed input then I'm interested in the effect that heavy tail input has on the system. This time I will talk about uh, 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 sample covariance matrices with heavy tailed input so heavy tailed multivariate time series and um, this is joint work with Richard Davis, long-standing collaborator and a former PhD student of Richard and Claudia Klipperberg and Robert Stelzer from Munich. So I will have to explain what I mean by heavy tailed. Uh, will mean uh, I will explain the notion of some kind of regular ring time series. It will be very simple in a way. Multivariate, I mean the dimension of the time series is not necessarily fixed. It will actually increase to infinity together with the sample size. So what's the mot motivation for this? I mean, nowadays we have a lot of data, sometimes too much data, and uh, we do not really always know what to do with it. So, I mean, there are very different fields where we have large dimensional data, a relatively short time series. Um, I mean, here are some areas of allocation. Maybe it will be convenient to think of a portfolio of uh, assets, so like the standard and Poor's 500, there are 500 assets, where each of them you have a time series of returns, say. And there is some kind of dependence through time, but also dependence across the assets. And um, because you have this very high dimensional um, Time series, 500 dimension, um, and maybe you have only one year of data, which is maybe 250 data points. So maybe you, you, you want to do something about uh, this sample covariance, where you usually are interested in estimating the, the covariances inside the uh, portfolio. And one way of reducing the dimension is that you look at the principal component analysis, so you try to determine the, the largest eigenvalues in your, in your sample covariance matrix and then you, you try maybe to pick out the largest uh, the, the components in your time series which corresponds to the, the largest ones. Okay, but let me come to the model. The model is um, this one. First um, we, we look at the a matrix P times n matrix X with n observations. So think of the time series of 250 um, daily observations of the standard and poor's 500. P dimensional, it would be 500 dimensional. T stands for time. So T is our time series. T is time. And P is a dimension. And then we look at the sample covariance matrix. So the sample covariance matrix is a typical estimator of the covariance matrix, which we typically don't know. Um, so it's x6 transpose. And you see, I don't have the normalization 1 over n, which you typically have here, because I'm interested in, in heavy tailed analysis. And we'll see that the normalization 1 over n might not be most uh, appropriate here. So I leave it without the normalization 1 over n. And I'm interested in studying the sequence of the ordered eigenvalues. So the, I will usually write uh, lambda with parentheses in the subscript uh, for the ordered eigenvalues. Lambda 1 is the largest one, lambda p is the smallest one. Okay. So if you just uh, start from uh, 
simple model like you take uh, um, independent identically distributed strictly stationary ergodic time series in each row of your x. And then you calculate the uh, sample covariance matrix you normalize as 1 over n here. Then you can just use the law of large numbers for fixed p. And then you have convergence towards the identity matrix, the p times p. So in this case, it's all pretty clear what happens to the largest dying values, right? And uh, so this is kind of a benchmark for fixed p. Um, of course, you would also like to know what can I say about the rate of convergence of the largest eigenvalue divided by n. And there is classical work by uh, Ted Anderson, already from 1963, who also did, by the way, similar analysis for dependent time series, not only for IID standard normals. Um, so we found out that the rate of convergence is something as squared of n. And the limit is normal in this case. Um, and uh, this is the case when P is fixed, and then later, Johnston, when people started looking at large data sets and they tried to calculate the covariance matrix, so he started working with IID standard normals, but he allowed the P to depend on N. So basically, P is uh, proportional to N with some gamma. And his results, uh, his result is this one here. Looks a bit complicated. First of all, you see uh, that uh, the normalization is not N anymore, but it's something else. I mean, it's of the order N, right? Here. But it's not exactly N. And then you see they have a larger um, scaling factor here, so it's roughly speaking n to the two thirds. So the rate of conversions is faster in this case when p goes to infinity. And there is a very significant difference here, the limits. You don't get a normal distribution here, but you get the so called trace evidum distribution, which is some kind of a generic distribution in the sea of random matrices. Okay, so this is in the case of IID standard normals. Uh, then, of course, people have tried to generalize this result, and there is one outstanding result uh, due to Tao and Wu. It's a so-called four-moment theorem. They show that if you ent the, the entries of your matrix are IID and you have a fourth finite moment of the entries of your matrix, then the result of Johnston remains true. There have been many other people here who have been working on related topics, sample covariances. But uh, in applications, for example, if you think of the standard in Purus 500, um, and you think of your, 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 your time series X with uh, 500 rows, then you have dependence. You have dependence through time and you have dependence across the rows. Of different assets, so there might be some dependence between them. And uh, there's also a fact from econometrics and extreme value theory, as you like, many people have been working on uh, financial time series, that many return series uh, have infinite force moment. So what can you say in this case? What can you say about sample covariances? This is why Richard and I started looking at heavy-tailed random matrices with some dependent entries. So, in order to, to have some kind of a simple model, um, we, we, we started with a linear model. So, we have a linear model with some deterministic H's, which have to satisfy some summability condition. And uh, then we have something like an infinite moving average, both in time and across the rows. So the Zs here are independent identically distributed. And their distribution has some kind of polar tails. I call this regular varying 
ID noise. So the ZITs are independent identically distributed in I and T run. And the index of regular variation is uh, between 0 and 4. So in particular, this was implied that the force moment is infinite. So here is a, is a precise description of what I mean by, by Paul or tails, but maybe it's, uh, it's too compact. So I assume that the uh, right and the left tails of the The random variables Z, they have kind of a power law tail. The L is a slow bank function, so it's a flat function, not very interesting in our context here. And you have a tail balance condition that means P and Q are basically the probability that you have a positive or a negative value for your Z. And P plus Q is equal to 1, so you have a probability distribution on the directions as you like. So alpha, you see, appears here, is the index of regular variation, so that's a power of this x. And this an here, which uh, appears, is uh, a normalization, which will appear throughout. So take x equal to 1, then you see that the an is, is roughly speaking, the one minus one over n quantile of the distribution of the absolute value of that. So it's a standard normalization in extreme value theory in the case when you have Paolo tails. So these will be the model assumptions. Um, it is well known that the um, tails of x, the xits, they inherit the Paolo behavior. So roughly speaking, the right tail of x is of the same kind as this one, times a constant which depends on the coefficients h. And you can say something similar for the left tail. By the way, if p or q is equal to 0, then you would interpret this as little o of l of x divided by x to the power alpha. So we allow for degenerate cases. By this model, I think if you do time series analysis, you will first start with a linear model that have been people doing since Grunander and Rosenblatt and many others in the 1950s and 1940s. You start with a linear model. Um, motivation at that time was that you looked at the Gaussian time series and you can basically describe any reasonable uh, time series, Gaussian time series in a linear as a linear time series, particularly the class of armor processes. Um, if you go away from the Gaussian case, then it is not the only reasonable class of linear processes, but we basically take this model because we can deal with it. So it's for practical reasons. Okay, so I told you that I want to let P go to infinity together with the sample size. And um, uh, we need different rates for p. So the easiest case is when alpha is between 0 and 1. In this case, p can grow like any power of n. Actually, we can even have some, some kind of uh, semi-exponential growth for p. So it can grow it like e to the power n to the beta, where beta is less than 1. Things become complicated when alpha is larger than 1. Then we need some restriction here you see here on the beta. But still, the case that p can be equal to n is included in this case. Things become more complicated when alpha is between 2 and 4. In this case, we have a rather strong restriction on beta. So it excludes this case here. Um, this is due to the techniques we use, uh, but we couldn't avoid conditions like this one. They're certainly not optimal. Okay, so then in the um, 
formulation of the results, I will use these quantities here. You remember the zits are independent identically distributed to sums them up. So you get sums di, which in principle depend on n, which are independent identically distributed. So I only write di instead of din. And uh, so that we don't forget here the, let's write it down. And I also consider the order statistics of this object. Of course, these order statistics now depend on this n here. You have sums, right, of independent identically distributed sums of ID random variables. So again, the, the largest one is D1, and then the smallest one is DP. So I will need the order statistics of these sums of squares. And I will need this operator here. M, H, H transpose, so the, the, the entries of this matrix are given by HIL, the sum of HIL, HJLs. So I will need the matrix M. push up. And uh, I will need the, the eigenvalues, which I denote by Vs, possibly infinitely many different from, from zero. OK. And now I show you the main result, which is not very beautiful, but useful, as it will turn out. So it's something like an approximation of the ordered uh, eigenvalues of uh, this matrix or that matrix, depending on whether we are in the situation alpha between 0 and 2 or alpha between 2 and 4. So let me start with the case alpha between 0 and 2. So this is the case when we have infinite variance of our data. Um, in the case when alpha is between 2 and 4, um, the expected value of this xx transpose exists, so I can subtract them. And unfortunately, we have to. To be honest, we are not interested in the eigenvalues of the matrix xx transpose minus expected value. We are interested in the eigenvalues of this matrix. But uh, we had to subtract the, the expected value here because we are dealing with some large deviation problem, in which case we have to center. In both cases, we denote the ordered eigenvalues by these lambda risk parentheses. So lambda 1, again, is the largest up to lambda p. And then there is some auxiliary uh, sequence k, which depends on n. It's a little p of uh, uh, little o of p here, k squared. So k is a little o of squared of p, it's an integer sequence. And uh, it's not very important, but uh, has to appear here in the formulation of the result. And then the result tells us that we can approximate these ordered eigenvalues, lambda i, um, by some quantities, which I will explain. And uh, the rate of approximation here is something like a and p squared. Remember, p goes to infinity, n times p goes faster to goes to infinity at a faster rate than n. So this, this a n here, now you take a n p squared. That's the right normalization. So what are these quantities I'm approximating with? I mean, it's, again, rather easily formulated in the case when alpha has been with 0 and 2. Then, you know, I take, in principle, you see, I take the ordered values here, and I multiply with them the eigenvalues of this matrix M. So I multiply them, and I'm, I'm ordering them. And then the largest uh, lambda, lambda 1, would then be approximated by the largest value here. Well, I'm looking at the subsequence k, but it's not really important in the, in the limit. Unfortunately, when I have uh, to center, 
Again, I can't take the, uh, the natural ordering of the d's, but I have to subtract the mean. So see, I take now the, uh, these d's, subtract their mean, and then I order according to the absolute values, and I get these corresponding indices, L1 up to LP. And then I, I do a similar thing. I take now these, these uh, DLIs from these orderings and subtract the mean and multiply with the corresponding eigenvalues. So that's not very beautiful, but uh, that's the main result. Now, what do you do with such a result? Okay, so there is one fact that uh, I want to mention here. Is that um, regular variation has something to do with point process convergence. And in this case, we are not dealing with a point process for the observations themselves, but we are dealing with a point process for the sums of these z's, for the sums of the squares of these z's. Right? You see, this is a point process where, with um, points di divided by a and p squared. So the epsilon here, for those who don't know what a point process is, it's a direct measure. So that's a random measure here uh, with random atoms di divided by a and p squared. Is it like it's a counting measure if you apply this random measure to a given set? So we have convergence here in distribution of these random measures towards a random measure. And the question is what kind of a random measure is this we get here in the limit? And this is easily described. Namely, <clears throat> it has a very nice structure. You see that the uh, the gamma i's here to the power of minus 2 alpha, they depend on these sums of independent, identically distributed exponentials. And uh, we know that if you take the totality of these points gamma i, then you have the points of a homogeneous Poisson process with rate 1 on the positive free line. And then the theory of point process tells us if I transform the points of a Poisson process by some reasonable measurable function, which is a power, for example, then I get a Poisson process, which is not homogeneous anymore, but inhomogeneous. Okay, let me explain this a little bit more in detail. Where does the theory come from? There is a great book by Sid Resnick, written in 1987. In the meantime, he has written another book uh, called Heavy Tail Phenomena, 2007, where you can also find the corresponding theory. So he deals with the theory of point process, among others, which is important in an extreme value theory for dependent observations in particular. And in the case alpha between 0 and 2, which is the easy one, um, it follows from the results in Resnick that this point process here of the scaled points di converges in distribution to this point process, which is a Poisson process, if and only if, as you like, the expected value of this point process at the set x to infinity converges to this value. So you see, if you take the expected value here, you apply these direct measures to the sets x infinity, then you get exactly these expressions on the left hand side. So p times the same thing, namely the tail of d1, because of i d, larger than a and p squared times x. This has to converge to x to the power of minus alpha over t2 for every positive x. Now, it is clear that a relation like this one holds if the d1 is just one random variable z, but the d1 is a sum. It's a sum of id random variables. So it's not clear, if you just don't know any theory, that 
this relation will hold. Unfortunately, there are two brothers who had been working on this, Alexander and Sergei Nagayev. They proved that there is a large deviation result in the heavy-tailed case, which gives us this result. That's what we need. So, as you like, uh, the uh, Agaev theory Remember, D1 is written there. The Nagayev theory tells us this behaves like P times N times one of the Z squares. And now you use the, um, the regular variation of the Z. You may remember I have written it in a rather complicated way here. I use this relation to get that this here converges to x to the power minus alpha over 2 for positive x. This is not the trivial result. Actually, it holds uniformly over all sequences p going to infinity and then positive x. So the rate of convergence of this guy approximated by this one is uniform, which is sometimes useful. Okay, again, back to this result by Resnick. He also has a result in the case when uh, we take uh, alpha between 2 and 4. In this case, I told you we have to subtract the mean. And this is the reason why we do it, because we need this point process convergence, which is equivalent to the fact that we have to check these two large deviation conditions. So we have to subtract the mean, otherwise this result doesn't hold. And in this case, we have to check two conditions because d minus e expected value might be negative, but it is not too negative as you can see here because you get zero for the left tail. That means in the limit you get only points which are positive. So there are no points on the negative axis. So I told you this here is a Poisson process because the points are transformed points of a homogeneous Poisson process. And if you now take um, these values here in the limit, they're, as you like, the expected values of the interval from uh, x to infinity, or if you take the negative x's from minus infinity to minus x. And this characterizes the Poisson process in the limit, which is now a non-homogeneous Poisson process. But there's a, still a nice intensity function, which is a Paolo. Of course, you see that this point process has um, a pole at zero. The intensity function explodes at zero. I mean, there is some theoretical reason that one has to, to take the, the point zero from the state space. Otherwise, we have a problem. But this is only a small technical problem. Okay, but let's go back to this point process result here. The good thing about point process is that once you have a convergence result, you can use continuous mappings of all kinds. So one of the possible uh, continuous mappings you can use is, first of all, you could multiply the di's here with the, the v's the uh, eigenvalues and then you could also then you get the uh, point process depending on the vj's here and you can sum them up possibly infinite r is the rank of this matrix m and the good thing is that the continuous mapping theorem tells us if i sum them up here on the left hand side i can also sum them up on the right hand side and you can basically read of the points. So what you have to do, you have to multiply the points and the limit by the VJs, and then you have to sum up these possibly infinite Poisson processes. So, and now we come back to the main result, which looked not very useful so far. But um, the main result tells us that we can approximate the lambda i's by these points, d i's times v j's. And this is what we do next. 
So it's again kind of a continuous mapping argument that means we can approximate these points here by the eigenvalues or the other way around, the eigenvalues by these points ti, vj, properly scaled. So that means that the point process of the eigenvalues, properly scaled, converges to this point process. If alpha is between 2 and 4, we have to, we can do the same with the center di's. We have to, otherwise we don't get this point process convergence. But in the limits, you don't have to center. So the same result holds. OK, now, once you have point process conversions, I told you, you can use continuous mappings in rather different variations. So the most simple way of uh, using point process convergence is that you, you take the largest eigenvalues, so the largest points in your point process, and then they converge to the largest points in the limiting point process. So, if you remember the limit process, where is it, looks like this. So what you have to do, you have to order the points in the limit. They depend on the gamma i's and they depend on the vj's, on the, eigen, on the eigenvalues of the matrix M. So you have to order these guys and then you pick the m largest ones and then the m largest eigenvalues converge jointly to the m largest points in the limit. This result was proved in the case of IID random variables when the, the VJs are all equal to one. There's Soshnikov and other co authors. And also Richard Davis and Robert Stelzer and Oliver Pfeffel, they proved the result in the case when they had IID rows. So there was no dependence across the rows. The result is the same as in the IID case, so as if you had IID entries. So as long as you don't have dependence across the rows, you don't have any effects which are different from the IID case. So that's these VJs here, they create something new. Okay, now let's look at the example, it's uh, this one. You see you have a moving average here of order two. Um, in time, but also across the rows. So you have i and i minus 1. That's the important thing. In this case, you can simply calculate the, uh, the matrix M here, which is a diagonal matrix, has only two elements, 8 and 2. So the largest eigenvalues are 8 and 2 in this case. The remaining ones are 0. And now you use the, the theory and then you would see that the largest eigenvalue converges to 8 times gamma 1 to the power minus 2 of alpha. And for the second largest eigenvalue, do you have to take the, the second largest of these points of the Poisson process? Well, then you have to take V2 and multiply with this gamma 1 to the minus 2 of alpha, or you have to take 8 and then you take the second largest of these powers of gamma. So now the question is, what, what is the distribution of this gamma 1 to the power minus 2 of alpha? I mean, this is easy to write down. Um, for people in extreme value theory, they know that. The 2 of alpha, is it? 2 of alpha. Gamma 1 is an exponential, a standard exponential. So you simply can calculate this here. And you see this is a Frechet distribution with parameter alpha over 2. So the, the first component is uh, Frechet distributed. The second one is complicated, so it's not, it doesn't have a name, the distribution. Okay, there, there are simple examples where you can do nice things. For example, 
If you assume that your coefficients h and the matrix um, are separable, so you can write them as a product of some theta and some c's, and then you can calculate this matrix M here, and then you see that you basically get the matrix like this one, t di, theta j, some of the CL squares, so that's just a constant. And if you look carefully, you see that this, this uh, matrix here, this operator has uh, rows which are proportional to each other. So you take uh, theta j's and you multiply them with some theta i according to the rows. That means this matrix has rank one, and then you can calculate the corresponding largest eigenvalue, which is just uh, the product of the sum of the squares of the two coefficient sequences. Now, in this case, we have only v1, namely this one, and then you can do uh, the calculations we have done before. So the largest m eigenvalues would converge towards these guys here times v1. So if v1 were not there, we would have the result of the IID case. But the power of uh, the joint convergence is that you can now look at all kinds of interesting continuous mappings. Maybe you want to know what is the, the contribution of the largest eigenvalue to the sum of the m largest eigenvalues. And then you would get a limit like this one. This is not the distribution which you can explicitly write down, but uh, it's, uh, you can at least simulate it in an easy way. Now, you can do more. So far, we looked at finitely many order statistics and looked at the joint convergence toward the joint convergence of the points, uh, toward the vector in the, of the points in the limit. You can increase the number of points in some sense. And this is another idea which goes back to at least Sid Resnick or also people like Woodrow Zinn and others. Um, so what you can show in the case alpha between 0 and 2, that's the easy case, is if you look at, say, the largest eigenvalue and the sum of all eigenvalues. This is a trace of the matrix M. So you see you have an increasing number of lambdas here involved. In this case, you can't use the classical continuous mapping theorem. You can use a um, continuous mapping theorem where you have a mapping because it's almost surely continuous. So it's not exactly continuous, but quite. And then you get what you want, namely that you take the sum of the points here and you take the sum of the points in the limit. And the limiting points are Vj times these gamma i to the power minus 2 of alpha. You take all the sums, and this is the limit. And now you, 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 you look at this, and then we have already identified the distribution of the, this guy here, which is Frechet distributed. Now the question is, what is the distribution of the sum of the gamma i's to the power minus 2 of alpha? And happily, there is what the people call the series representation of an alpha over two stable random variable. The series representation of an alpha over two stable random variable is exactly this. So you take these Poisson points, sum them up, and you get an alpha over two stable random variable which is totally skewed to the right, so it's positive. Of course, these two guys are dependent because the gamma one is here and the gamma one is there. So, of course, now you have the joint convergence, and you can look, say, at the, the ratio of the largest eigenvalues in the trace of our covariance matrix. You see, you don't have to normalize because the normalization cancels in the nominator and denominator, and then you would get a ratio like this one. So, for Shea, the divided by the alpha over 2 stable. And if alpha is between 2 and 4, in this case, we would have to, divide, to subtract the means here, right? The means in, the, in this sample covariance matrix. In this case, you get 
a result which is similar but not quite the same. Because, you see, if you tried to calculate this infinite series here for alpha between 2 and 4, and you know that gamma is a sum of ID exponentials, so by the law of large numbers, the gamma i's would behave like i asymptotically. That means this series would diverge. So in this case, you have to subtract the means in some sense. So then this series won't converge absolutely, but it will converge after subtracting the means here. So you have to do something. OK, let's leave out this. Um, how can I explain why we get this result? I mean, the idea is, in principle, rather simple. And I will try to explain it in the case of a moving average of order 2. And I will ensure that we have dependence across the rows. So we involve zi and zi minus 1. And we only look at the case alpha between 0 and 2. Otherwise, you would have to subtract the means. So let's start with an element of the sample covariance matrix in the diagonal. In this case, you have the sum of the squares. You take the model here, use the binomial formula, and then you get sums of squares and sums of mixed terms. And you identify these sums of squares here as our di's, which are written here. That's di, that's di minus 1. And then we have a sum of mixed terms. And um, if you see, if you look at this here, the, the you have products of independent z's here. And then you, you sum over t's, so you get a sum of i, d products of independent z's. And in this case, one thing helps, namely, it is well known that if you take two independent z's and suppose you only look at the right tail and then in this case you get a tail behavior which is of this order for positive x, x goes to infinity. L is a slow Levesque function, not very important in this case. What's important is that if you take the product of two independent z's, which are regular varying with index alpha, you get something which is regular varying with index alpha. While, if you take the z square, the guys which appear here, well, this guy doesn't show anything, they have a tail index alpha divided by two, so they're much more heavy tailed. So in a way, these guys here are much more light-tailed. I don't know why this does not work. Well, now everything goes wrong. So these guys here, you sum up regular ring. Of course, we will just have an index alpha. Of course, then you have to prove some large deviation result that the tails of the sums of these guys are also lighter than the tails of the sums of these guys, but this is not too complicated. Okay, now you look at an element of the diagonal. So you take xi t, xi plus 1 t, and you see something similar. You see that you get here the theta 0, theta 1, and then the di, and then you get mixed terms, and they're again of the order little o of a n square. So, if you now look at the four of them together, you see that there is some kind of a pattern. So from the calculations before, we get uh, something like a matrix of this kind. Well, this is uh, um, the matrix we, we, we want. That's the matrix M. And then you get these di's here, and then you have some di minus ones and so, but there's only one element which is different from zero, and some remainder terms which are not important. So you can now show that the, the 
difference of the sample covariance matrix and this random sum here uh, with uh, the MIs, which are given by these uh, matrices here, deterministic, and the DIs, these random coefficients, that the, the spectral norm is of the order little of a and p squared. So in this case, you have to take care here that you have many mixed terms, so you need n times p. I mean, it's not enough to have n squared here. You have to work here, of course. So, but it's not too bad. If you look at, the, at the, this sum here, so what you do, you take this m1 multiply with d1, which is uh, a sum of squares, which is independent of the d2. You multiply d2 with m2. I mean, in principle, you are, could almost calculate the eigenvalues in this case. But there's only one problem here. And the problem is in this place. If you sum these guys up, multiply with D1 or with D2, then you have overlap here, right? Otherwise, you are close to a block diagonal matrix. So you want to create a block diagonal matrix. In this case, you can calculate the eigenvalues. So what can we do? We could perhaps randomize the order of the, of the DIs. So we try to avoid that neighbors are, neighbor, are neighbors. So we try to, to reorder them so that M1 and M2 are not neighbors anymore. That's the basic idea. So you could uh, permute the DIs, for example, according to their order. That's what we are doing here in the first step. So that's the same sum as we saw before. That's the sum of di's times mi's. You rewrite it, permutation. Then you can show that you can actually truncate this here, this sum. You only need the, the k, um, the k largest of these guys. So for some slowly de increasing sequence k. And then you choose a k in a very particular way, as I showed in the main result, namely that k is of the order little of square root of p. And in this case, one can show that on this set AK, it is very unlikely that um, we get neighbors. So the indices LI and LJ are separated by at least one if I and J are different from zero. And this guy here has a very high probability. It con probability of this guy converges to one. So we can work on this set, which has very high probability. So that means that now we don't have neighbors anymore when we sum up these elements. And once we don't have neighbors anymore, we have a block diagonal matrix. And we know how to calculate the eigenvalues of block diagonal matrices. So in this case, we have rank one, so there's only one eigenvalue different from zero, which is this one. And then you have to multiply with the corresponding ordered values of the Ds. And finally, there is a strong inequality by Hammer and Weil. He has proved many inequalities, of course, in his life, um, which tells us that we uh, can compare the ordered eigenvalues of our sample covariance matrix with these ordered eigenvalues um, or ordered values DLI times uh, constants by the spectral norm of this uh, object here, but we know it converges to zero in probability and then we need many more truncations here. So for example, if you don't have a moving average of order two, but you have a moving average of order 10, then you can do very much the same, but you could have that you get an infinite operator here. So with infinitely many elements h different from zero, in this case, you have basically first to reduce everything to moving average of finite order. I have to show that this works, and it does. OK, so um, there are some problems here which we couldn't solve. I told you the case alpha between 2 and 4 is messy. We don't know how to avoid the centering. We have a good feeling that the centering is not necessary in this case. Then the limit result would change. 
And the order, of the order of p is not optimal in this case. We are, we are aware of that. So I think you should at least be able, in the case alpha between 2 and 4, that p is uh, proportional to n. We can't handle minima. It's not the classical extreme value theory where you say, OK, I have a theory for maxima. I multiply everything by minus 1. And then I have minima, or I take minima, multiply by minus 1, have maxima. That doesn't work here. So from the theory, it follows that with a normalization, a and p squared, the minima would converge to 0. This is not very informative. So there must be a different theory. Same for low order statistics, eigenvectors, determinants, everything is complicated. Nonlinear structures, yes, that will be interesting to get at least some simple examples. I mean, the theory in our case works and is relatively simple because uh, we can somehow identify the effects of the largest values in the time series. This is where we have the squares of the sets. And we can exclude the mixed terms coming from the sets. And here again, a question arises, uh, which has maybe something to do with your question you asked in the beginning. Uh, how can we define a reasonable high dimensional time series? For example, if you're interested in the financial time series, you would have to have a, something like a multivariate gauge where the dimension increases with the sample size. It's not really clear. Of course, what you can do, you can take independent time series. But this would not be a good model for the standard and poorest, right? So you want to have dependence across the rows. A student of mine is now working with so-called sample autocovariance matrices, going back to some work of, of Lam and Yao and the analysis of statistics. Here the idea is that you, you if you look at the definition of um, sample covariance matrix, that you take here the delect um, components. So it's instead of t in both cases, you would here have t plus k, say. And then you look at a joint vector of such matrices and consider the corresponding eigenvalues. OK, thank you. Thomas, uh, I guess uh, you miss uh, among open problems that H could be random. That's not a problem. You can take it independent of the, the Zs and everything works. As long as you have, uh, um, as long as you have uh, 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 some ability condition for the Hs. That's so this is enough? Yeah, if, if they're independent, it's fine. If you have dependence between the H's and the Z's, then we, I don't know. But if they're independent, then, of course, then uh, mm -hmm. you get the V's, or then, uh, yeah, they're not deterministic, but then you could take the largest eigenvalues of the random matrices H, and you get the same theory. So you can work conditional on mm -hmm. the H's, and then because you have a conditional, you also have it unconditional. Yes, Philip. Well, I'll try to get. I'll try to get. You. So I have a question uh, regarding the uh, the motivation at the beginning. You mentioned uh, PCA and dimension reduction. Yes. But here I have the feeling that you need to know the edge to get the v and so on. Yes. So in practice, what, if we want to apply this reduction dimension, we should first fit. You would have to fit, yes. But this is already complicated. very complicated, because your PCA yeah. is used to reduce this. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. No, I don't claim this is of any practical importance. So it's just a result which uh, we found interesting in theory, just want to see what happens. Because you know that uh, in the case of uh, um, sample covariances and linear models. In the heavy-tailed case, you basically get the same results as in the case when you have all moments, as in the, in the Gaussian case. So here we have a 
basically something which is totally different. So it's not the same. So even if you had infinite variance and you work with uh, the sample covariances of a linear process, you wouldn't have to worry. I mean, the limit distribution is a little bit unpleasant because you get the ratio of stables and things like that. But in principle, the consistency results hold, and actually the rates of conversion are even faster. But here you have something which is completely, completely different. So I don't know how to answer your question in a reasonable way. More questions or comments? Okay, doesn't seem like that. So let's thank Thomas and all the speakers of this morning.